Nazis, prison, treason. Now broadcasting from beautiful downtown Tallahassee, it's Classic Movie Reviews with Snark. Welcome to today's show, Stalag 17, 1953. My name is John. As always, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes or follow the links to social media in the podcast show notes. You can also go to snarkymoviereviews.com to read notes, bios, and other random movie thoughts. Remember, this show is completely free and independent. All that I ask is that you jump over to iTunes and give me a review. I love this movie. It's been my favorite movie for most of my adult life. Occasionally it's eclipsed by A Bridge Too Far 1977 when I'm focusing on bureaucracies, but I jump back to Stalag 17 1953 when I'm feeling really cynical. William Holden, who I think is a much better actor than most people believe, is amazing as Sefton, a POW with no redeeming societal value. Holden's wife told him he only received the Best Actor Oscar for this role as an apology for not winning it for Sunset Boulevard, 1950. However, it is much harder to play a character that no one likes. Holden lobbied director Billy Wilder to make the character a little softer. He was only given one concession, and I believe this is what makes the whole movie work. At the end, I will look at a couple of things that might mitigate Sefton's attitude. Actors. We have a few actors that we have covered before, so I'll jump right in and begin with them. Funny man Harvey Limbeck played the role of Sergeant Harry Shapiro. Limbeck was covered in Episode 60, The Command, 1964. He did a great job keeping things light without turning this film into a farce. You I don't like. You he don't like. And when Eric Von Zeppa don't like somebody, they stay don't like. Limbeck is one of the many high spots in this film. One of the notes on IMDb.com said that Jewish prisoners of war were moved to concentration camps and no one named Shapiro would be there. However, this was not done to American prisoners of war, since by the time they started ending up in German POW camps, many could see that the end was coming. Neville Brand played Duke, a gruff, no-nonsense reactionary. Brand was first discussed in episode 30, Birdman of Alcatraz, 1962. Sig Rubin played the seemingly friendly German Sergeant Johann Sebastian Schultz. Rubin was covered in episode 76, House of Frankenstein, 1944. William Holden played the lead role of Sergeant J.J. Sefton, a prisoner with no regard for his fellow POWs. Holden was born in 1918. Living in Pasadena, Holden was spotted by a talent scout for Paramount Pictures in 1937 while playing the part of an 80-year-old man. Holden had two uncredited roles before his first starring role in Golden Boy, 1939, in which he played a violinist turned boxer. After Columbia Pictures picked up half of his contract, he made minor pictures for Paramount and Columbia before serving as a second lieutenant in the United States Army Air Corps during World War II, where he acted in training films for the first motion picture unit. Beginning in 1950, his career took off when director Billy Wilder tapped him to star as the hack screenwriter Joe Gillis, who moved in with a faded silent film star Norma Desmond, played by Gloria Swanson, in Sunset Boulevard, 1950. Following this breakthrough film, his career quickly grew in stature as he played a series of roles that combined good looks with cynical detachment. These roles include Prisoner of War Entrepreneur in Stalag 17, 1953, for which he won the Academy Award for Best Actor. To me, this is one of his greatest roles and one of the greatest movies of all time. He played a pressured young engineer slash family man in Executive Suite 1954 a conflicted jet pilot in the Korean War film The Bridges at Tokari, 1954, a carefree playboy in Sabrina, 1954. One of his most widely recognized roles is as an ill-fated prisoner in The Bridge on the River Kwai, 1957, with Alex Guinness, a World War II tugboat captain in The Keys, 1958, and an American Civil War military surgeon in John Ford's The Horse Soldiers, 1959, opposite John Wayne. His career peaked in 1957 with the enormous success of The Bridge on the River Kwai. By the mid-1960s, the quality of his roles and films had noticeably diminished. In 1969, Holden made a comeback when he starred in director Sam Peckinpah's graphically violent western, The Wild Bunch, which won him much acclaim. 
Five years later, he starred with Paul Newman and Steve McQueen in the disaster film The Towering Inferno. He was also praised for his role in the classic Network 1976. In 1980, Holland appeared in The Earthling with Ricky Schroeder. Dying of cancer in the Australian outback, he meets a young orphan and teaches him how to survive. During his last years, Holden also appeared in When Time Ran Out, a critical and commercial failure. His final film was Blake Edwards' SOB 1981, and it was very successful. Holden was alone and intoxicated in his apartment in Santa Monica, California on November 12, 1981, when he slipped on a rug, severely cutting his forehead on a table, and bled to death. Evidence suggests he was conscious following the fall. In his drunken state, he probably didn't realize how badly injured he was. His body was found four days later. Don Taylor played down-flying officer Lieutenant James Dunbar. Taylor was covered in Episode 50, Battleground, 1949. Otto Priminger played the role of the sadistic German camp commandant, Oberst von Scherbach. Priminger was born in Austria-Hungary in 1905. Priminger directed his first film in 1931. He came to the United States in 1936 and started directing on Broadway. By 1944, he was a top-rated director, having directed the film noir classic Laura, 1944. Other great films include Forever Amber, 1947, Where the Sidewalk Ends, 1950, Carmen Jones, 1954, River of No Return, 1954, The Court Martial of Billy Mitchell, 1955, The Man with the Golden Arm, 1955, St. Joan, which we have already reviewed, Anatomy of a Murder, 1959, Porgy and Bess, 1959, Exodus, 1960, Advise and Consent, 1962, Bunny Lake is Missing, 1965, and In Harm's Way, 1965, which we've also reviewed. His last directorial role was The Human Factor, 1979. Preminger died in 1986. Peter Graves played the role of Sergeant Frank Price, the head of security. Graves was born in Minnesota in 1926. His brother is James Arness of Gunsmoke fame. Graves spent two years in the United States Air Force before attending the University of Minnesota, where he studied drama. His first film was Rogue River, 1951. Graves was in many films, with a high number of them being westerns. Other films include The Long Gray Line, 1955, The Night of the Hunter, 1955, and the wonderfully funny Airplane, 1980. However, he is best known as Jim Phelps in Mission Impossible, 1966 to 1973. Graves died in 2010. Story. This movie was shot in sequence, and many of the actors were surprised by the ending. The story takes place during the Battle of the Bulge in December 1944. The story is told in flashback by Sergeant Clarence Harvey Cookie Cook, Gil Stratton. He explains that there are 630 American airmen that are all sergeants. It is almost Christmas and two American POWs, Manfredi and Johnson, are preparing to escape. All the men are lying awake waiting for the signal. On the signal, they jump up and lift the stove, revealing a trap door. Sergeant Hoffy Hoffman, Richard Erdman, gives them civilian clothes to change into. This would classify them as spies and subject them to being executed. Sergeant Frank Price, Peter Graves, gives them their identification papers and goes over the plan again. Sergeant Sefton, William Holden, ask if they calculated the odds. The two men make it across the compound and enter a tunnel in the latrine. Back in the barracks, Sefton bets two packs of cigarettes they don't make it out of the forest. I'll bet they make it to Friedrich's office. I bet they make it all the way to Switzerland. And I bet they don't get out of the forest. Price? Duke, played by Neville Brand, Sergeant Harry Shapiro, played by Harvey Limbeck, Hoffy, Sergeant Stanislaus Animal Kazawa, Robert Strauss, all bet against him in support of the escaping men. As the betting grows larger, Sefton has Cookie pull more cigarettes out of a very well-stocked footlocker. Manfredi and Johnson dig out of the end of the tunnel and are outside of the barbed wire. As soon as they stand up, they are killed by a machine gun crew waiting outside of the camp for their arrival. As the men in the barracks hear the machine gun, Cookie looks at Sefton. Sefton throws his cigarette away, deeply wishing he had lost the bet. Duke calls out Sefton for collecting his prize too early, and Sefton responds, asking if anybody wants to double their bet. The next morning, the Nazi guards woke the camp. 
For Barracks 4, where this story is taking place, the head guard is German Sergeant Johann Sebastian Schultz, Sig Ruhmann. He laughs and makes merry, but he has contempt for his enemy. Hey, Schultz. Yeah? As long as you're going to move somebody in, how about a couple of them Russian broads? Russian women prisoners? Jawohl. Some are not bad at all. Yeah. Just get us a couple with beautiful Gluckenspiel. <laughs> The POWs assemble in the muddy compound while a series of boards are laid out so that Commandant Oberus von Scherbach, Otto Priminger, will not have to get his boots muddy. To the side, under a tarp, are the machine gun bodies of Manfredi and Johnson. Von Scherbach tells the men that no one has ever escaped from Stalag 17. Good morning, sergeants. Nasty weather we are having, eh? And I so much hope we could give you a white Christmas, just like the ones you used to know. They uncover the bodies and show the prisoners the two dead men. Hoffi demands that the men be properly buried. Von Scherbach tells the camp that anyone outside after lights out will be shot and the stove covering the trap door will be removed. Animal throws a piccolo in the water near Von Scherbach and gets his boots muddy. When Von Scherbach demands to know who did it, all the men step forward. After von Scherbach tells the men that they will be deloused with cold water as punishment, they are dismissed. The prisoners go to the latrine to clean up, and Duke is giving Price, the security chief, a razzing because the Germans know so much. They begin arguing, and Duke tells Sefton, who has the best of everything, that there's a stoolie in the barracks. This is something it seems Sefton has already figured out. Their fight is interrupted by the arrival of female Russian prisoners. Animal falls over the deadline and is almost shot. In the barracks, the men are having watered-down potato soup. After most of the men eat, a prisoner starts washing his socks in the soup. Sefton starts frying a fresh egg. As the hungry men watch, Duke comes around and starts to question Sefton about what he gave for the eggs. It turns out to be the cigarettes he won betting against Manfredi and Johnson. Come on, Trader Horn. Let's hear it. What'd you give the crowds for that egg? Forty-five cigarettes. Price has gone up. That wouldn't be the cigarette you took us for last night. What was I going to do with him? I only smoke cigars. Sefton says everybody trades. He's just sharper at it and that he learned to be that way when he was robbed the first weekend. Duke and he get into a shoving match that Hoffy breaks up. Sefton gives the egg to Joey, a man that has lost his mind due to trauma. Price starts questioning Sefton about why he bet against Manfredi and Johnson. He says he liked the odds and wasn't going to try and escape and was fine being a living prisoner for the rest of the war. Sefton and Duke scuffle again. The camp newsmen come in and give a briefing before the handover of the radio that a man with one leg has hidden up his pants. Barracks 4 only gets the radio for two days because the other barracks think they are jinxed and will lose it to the Germans. They have a metal net that they use for volleyball and use as an antenna. The news from the radio tells of the German breakthrough at the Battle of the Bulge and the before Christmas reports seem horrible for the Americans. Five panzer divisions and nine infantry divisions of von Rundstedt's army are pouring into the wide breach. Krauts have busted through. A second German wedge is reported 14 miles west of Melmody where tank columns cut the road to Bastogne. About this time, Schultz and some guards come to pick up the stove. Price, Hoppy, and Duke begin to question him about the stoolie. But Schultz just says how much he likes Americans and that he traveled as a wrestler in America. Well, well, gentlemen, am I interrupting something? Yeah, Schultz, we're just passing out guns. Guns? Ah, oh, you're joking. Always with the wisecrackers. <laughs> wisecrackers? Where did he pick up his English? In a pretzel factory? You always think I'm a square. I've been to America. I've been wrestling there. I wrestled in Milwaukee, in St. Louis, in Cincinnati, and I will go back. The way the war is going, I will be there before you. <laughs> you should live so long. <laughs> yeah, that's me in Cincinnati. Who's the other wrestler, the one with the mustache? That's my wife. Sefton says, why don't you just tell them it's me, as Schultz ushers the last man out. When Schultz is alone, he sees that the light cord is tied in a loop. He opens a queen on the chessboard, and there is a note inside. Schultz replaces it with one from his pocket and unties the loop before leaving. 
The barracks four men are outside to dig and fill the escape tunnel. They see a wagon carrying the coffins of Manfredi and Johnson. Cookie begins to wonder who the stoolie is. All he knows is that it's not him. He wonders if it's Sefton and begins to give the story of Sefton's hustles that are all based on cigarette betting. Sefton has a horse racing track that uses mice, a schnapps distillery that uses potato peels, and a telescope where the men can have a timed view of the Russian women being deloused. Hoffy, Price, and Duke are against these diversions as they feel it will make the Nazis punish them if they are discovered. Two days before Christmas, everything has calmed down, but Duke is still riding Sefton. They bring in a new prisoner, Lieutenant James Dunbar, Don Taylor. The normal procedure is to separate prisoners into enlisted, sergeants, and officers. The enlisted don't cause trouble because they have no leadership. The officers plan and plan, but never execute, while the sergeants just take action. This is why this movie and The Great Escape 1963 are all about sergeants. As soon as Dunbar gets into the barracks, Sefton starts giving him grief. It seems they know each other from officers' candidate school and from living in Boston. Sefton resents Dunbar's family wealth. Sefton loads up with a bottle of booze and a carton of cigarettes before heading out. The reason Dunbar could not get to the officers' camp was because someone blew up a German ammunition train in Frankfurt. The Germans suspected Dunbar but didn't know how he could do it. The sergeant traveling with Dunbar tells him that Dunbar blew up the train using a small time bomb. The lieutenant will be with us for a week or so until the crowd ship into the officers' camp in Silesia. Seems like all the railroad lines out of Frankfurt are fouled up because somebody blew up an ammunition train. Somebody, my eye. The lieutenant did it. Right in the station. Fifty German guards around. Before he is warned that there might be a stoolie in the barracks. The light cord is shown to be in a loop and Schultz unexpectedly shows up. He tells the POWs that the Geneva man is coming and they will be issued new blankets. Then he says that he wants the radio. Uh, the commandant also told me to pick up the radio. Radio? What radio show? But the one you are hiding in the barracks, don't you know? I once talked to an American POW, and he said that the closer the American army got, the less the Germans would punish you for having a radio. At the end, they would simply take it away with no consequence. Schultz pokes around for a bit, then pulls the radio out of its hiding place in a bucket. Schultz is laughing until he sees the tied light cord. Schultz sends him out to get the blankets, then he switches the queens on the chessboard. Back in the barracks, the gang descends on Cookie, wanting to know the whereabouts of Sefton. With Hoffie's okay, they bust into Sefton's locker. He has stockings, cuckoo clocks, cameras, booze, and cigarettes. About this time, Duke busts in and tells the men that Sefton is in the Russian women's compound. They figure that's what he got for the radio. Hoffie destroys the telescope. When Sefton gets back, the entire barracks are waiting for him. What's the matter, boys? My slip showing? I'll say it is. You spilled a little borscht on it. Borscht? Did you have a good time over there? Oh, somebody was peeking. Yeah, had a dreamy time. Those dames, they really know how to throw a party. I've known some women in my time, but between you and me, there's just nothing like the hot breath of the Cossacks. There are a couple of blonde snipers over there, real man killers. They, they accuse him of being the stoolie. What about the radio? Yeah. What about it? Cut the horsing around. We know he's the stoolie and we know what the payoff is. So let's get on with it. Let's get on with what? What is this anyway, a kangaroo court? Why don't you get a rope and do it right? You make my mouth water. You're all wire happy, boys. You've been in this camp too long. You put two and two together and it comes out four, only it ain't four. Just about the time they are going to beat Sefton, von Scherbach comes personally to pick up Dunbar because of the ammunition train. As soon as the Germans leave, the whole barracks beat Sefton to within an inch of his life. The day before Christmas, the Geneva man, Red Cross, shows up. In the packages they brought were 2,000 ping pong balls. Sefton is lying beaten in his bunk, and he tries to pay off Schultz to find out who the stoolie is. The men come in and see Sefton handing a stack of cigarettes to Schultz. It looks bad for Sefton. The Geneva man comes in, and the POWs have been ordered not to complain. Hoffy speaks up and asks about Dunbar. In Von Scherbach's office, they are keeping Dunbar awake to break him. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Of course you did. Twenty-six carloads of munition gone off like a trick cigar. The SS is running around in circles. 
The Gestapo is arresting the wrong people. And von Scherbach has caught the fish. If Dunbar blew up the train after he was captured, it would make him a saboteur under the Geneva Convention and the Germans would have the right to shoot him. The Geneva man says that von Scherbach will need details before he can convict Dunbar. Von Scherbach orders Schultz to find out how the bomb was made. The men are in the barracks, preparing for Christmas Eve by decorating their small trees and turning the ping-pong balls into a smoke bomb. Duke comes in with a phonograph that he has traded for Sefton's still. When the men are busy singing, Price sees the cord of the light in a loop. He takes a queen out of his bunk and switches it with one on the board. He secretly reads the note from Schultz. Damn! Hiding in security? No one would look there. When the men come dancing by, he joins right in like he's their best friend. Sefton, lying in his bed, sees the straight light cord and begins to figure it out. Price goes to the sergeant that came in with Dunbar and gets him to tell how the time bomb was made. Price is told that you place a lit cigarette in a book of matches and it will take time for the cigarette to burn down and light the matches. I used to use this trick for setting off a string of black cats under somebody's carport. It gave me time to run home and establish an alibi before the explosion. That night the men are in the barracks singing and Duke takes Sefton's booze. Sefton watches the cord. The air raid sirens go off and Schultz comes in and ushers the men out of the barracks. Price hangs back and tells Schultz in German how the bomb was made. When they go out, Sefton steps out of the shadows, having seen the entire plot. On Christmas Day, the men are still enjoying the holidays. Shapiro dresses like a woman, an animal in a drunken haze thinks Shapiro is Betty Grable. Cookie begins to suspect Sefton, but Sefton runs down the whole scheme and talks about how to get rid of the German spy without getting reprisals. The SS men come to pick up Dunbar. Hoffy says he has a plan to snatch Dunbar from the Nazis. Sefton tricks Hoppy into making Price watch him so he can't give the plan away to Schultz. As Dunbar is brought out, Hoffy whistles the Air Corps song. You know, off we go into the wild blue yonder to let Dunbar know something is up. Blondie sets off the smudge pot, making smoke. The men rush forward and liberate Dunbar. But where will he be hiding? The Germans make a picture check of all the men. Price signals that he doesn't know to Schultz. Von Scharbach says he will pull the entire camp down in the morning if Dunbar is not found. Where was Dunbar? It sure drove the crowds crazy looking for him. They herded us all out into the compound and put some extra machine guns on us and gave us the old picture check. The crowd searched under the barracks, they searched the roofs, they even searched the bathroom in the commandant's office. But no Dunbar. Then they tried to smoke him out, throwing tear gas bombs into every barracks, just in case he was hiding up in the rafters. Then they made a stand for six hours out there until finally von Scherbach came out and gave us his ultimatum. If Dunbar didn't come out by next morning, he'd tear down the whole lousy compound stick by stick. And if we'd sleep in the mud for the rest of our lives, that was okay by him. The cameras pull back to show Dunbar hiding in the water tower. That night, Hoffy collects dog tags and says the one that gets drawn will have to take Dunbar out and it will be extra hard as the Germans have put on extra guards in expectation. They draw a tag and Price steps up and says he will take Dunbar out because he has done a bad job as security. Price gets the wire cutters from Duke and Hoffy tells him where Dunbar is hiding. Sefton steps up and bets two packs of cigarettes that Dunbar never makes it out of the camp. Two packs of cigarettes say Dunbar never gets out of the compound. Are you starting that again? Anybody cover? Somebody step on that crumb. We warned you, Sefton. Sure you warned me. You were going to slit the throat of that stoolie. Here's the knife to do it with. Only make sure you got the right throat. We're lucky at it. Hurry up on that trap door. What are you trying to do, gum up the works? That's right. Or would you rather see Dunbar lying out there in the mud in the morning like Manfredi and Johnson? He sticks a knife in the table to cut the throat of the stoolie. The rest of the men are enraged, but Sefton starts telling the tale of Price. He begins by telling the men that Hoffy told the Germans where Dunbar is hiding. Sefton slaps Price three times and questions him about Pearl Harbor. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? No, I don't sprechen Sie Deutsch. Maybe just one word? Kaput? Because you're kaput, Price. Will you get this guy out of my hair so I can go? Go where? To the commandant's office and tell him where Dunbar is? Why, I'll kill you for that! Shut up! 
Security officer, huh? Always screening everybody. Only who screens you? Great American hero from Cleveland, Ohio. Enlisted right after Pearl Harbor. When was Pearl Harbor, Price? Or don't you know that? December 7th, 41. What time? Six o'clock. I was having dinner. Six o'clock in Berlin. They were having lunch in Cleveland. Am I boring you boys? Go on. Price makes a mistake on the time. The men start to follow the story. Sefton pulls the queen out of Price's pocket and shows the light cord loop. Price breaks, tries to escape, screaming in German, but the men tackle and muffle him. Duke says to Sefton, Brother, were we all wet about you? Brother, were we all wet about you? Forget it. Sefton strikes a match on his face and says, Forget about it. Sefton gets the civilian clothes and wire cutters. He says he has taken Dunbar out, but only for the reward. You taken Dunbar? You betcha. There ought to be some reward money from Mama. Say, about 10000 bucks worth. The plan is to throw Price out into the compound to create a distraction. Exactly five minutes to get Dunbar out of that water tank. And then you throw Price out into the compound, nice and loud. Mm. You'll draw every light from every goon tower. Mm. Sefton gives the store a cookie, and when Animal asks about how to get with the Russian girls, Sefton says, get yourself a hundred cigarettes for the Kraut guards and get a new face. So long, cookie. You can have the department store. What's left of it? So long, Sefton. You're not disposing of those Russian broads, are you? Tell you what to do. Get yourself a hundred cigarettes for the Kraut guards. Then get yourself another face. <laughs> you could use a new one, too. <laughs> As Sefton drops into the trap door, he says, If I ever run into any of you bums on the street corner, just let's pretend we've never met. Just one more word. If I ever run into any of you bums on a street corner... Just let's pretend we never met before. He drops out of sight, then pops back up and gives a smile and a salute. This was the single softening of character that Wilder allowed, and it made the whole movie work and humanized Sefton. Sefton makes it to the water tower where Dunbar is hiding and taps out, off we go into the wild blue yonder. Dunbar's legs are frozen, and Sefton gets him ready. Right on schedule, the barracks men throw Price out with a gag and cans tied to him. All of the German lights and machine guns hit him immediately. As Price is shot down, Sefton and Dunbar cut their way through the wire and escape the camp. Von Sherbach and Schultz come out to look at the dead man, and they are all smiles until they see its price. Back in the barracks, Animal says Sefton only did it so he could steal the wire cutters. What do you know? The crud did it. I'd like to know what made him do it. Maybe he just wanted to steal our wire cutters. Did you ever think of that? Cookie smiles and begins whistling when Johnny comes marching home again. The end. Just a short note on Sefton. Was he really that bad? He was disgusted when Manfredi and Johnson were killed. He was robbed his first week in the camp. He took care of Cookie, who may have been weak. He also leveled the odds for Dunbar. Maybe not all that bad. World famous short summary? A rich man and a poor man from Boston take a European trip. If you enjoyed this week's show, please tell your friends, and if you really want to help, drop over to iTunes and give me a review. If you want to comment, recommend a movie, or just say hi, follow the links in the show note to my site. Beware the Moors.